Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio. It is the fourth Saturday of the week, so you know it is time to chat with Glenn Burrows. Glenn is over in England. He runs Norfolk Tours. He uh, works with people on their family history, especially if you're in you know, America, Australia, South Africa. A lot of us have roots back in England, and so he helps people trace their roots back and actually visit their ancestors' footsteps, literally. Um, he is here every fourth Saturday, as I was saying, and you can keep up with him at norfolk-tours.co.uk. All the links are in the show notes. But today he's talking about his, well, he just came back from Wales. Him and his wife and family went on a vacation. Then he crossed the border from Wales back into England. And he's going to talk about some living history he experienced as he stepped over the border. So welcome back, Glenn. How are you? Hello. Yeah, great. Thanks. Good to be it's, here. It's exciting to talk about living history in these sites that you were in all around Iron Bridge Gorge, which sounds like something you would hear about uh, back east here in the States. And it's interesting where you were, because at the end of your article, and everyone, there's an article and photos to see on this, um, link in show notes, you talk about Jamestown and Williamsburg. Now, are you talking about in England? No, I'm talking about America, because... Okay, um, I wanted to make sure, because I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm getting all confused here. I'm like, we're back sharing names again, like Norfolk, Virginia, no, Jamestown, no, no. Colonial, Williamsburg, yep. Yeah. We haven't got a Jamestown or a Williamsburg in England, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Well, what is, there's a Jamestown, California, too. Yeah. The, now, the reason the I the town. reason I mentioned them is because they they actually have living museums, and and I think that they're a really good way for people to actually get the feel of history, and mm -hmm. and one of the main ways of getting history is is the smell and the sounds because i don't i don't know about you but all you have to do is smell something and you're gone back to wherever it is mm -hmm. you know i know my my daughter she always if if ever she has um, um what we call a minced beef patty so that's pastry top and bottom with a minced beef and onion mixture in the middle mm. and gravy Whenever mm. she has that, she always says, oh, I remember Nanny's minced beef patty. Mm -hmm. Because the taste and the smell of that particular piece of food reminds her of Diane's mum because she, she used to make a minced beef patty. For me, apple crumble takes me back to my childhood where my grandmother used to make an apple crumble on a Friday when I used to go mm. up. You know, so smells tastes you know all them sorts of things are amazing for memory and they're Can also we talk about this yeah go ahead that, that apart from for memory they're good to actually put things into your head so although you know if you go to jamestown or williamsburg you're not going to remember what they were doing in them towns in the 16 1700s but it's going to give you an idea and a feeling about what they were doing because you can smell it and you can taste it and you can feel it and you know you're experiencing it it's all about an experience it is um and there's just juju there's like an atmosphere yeah as well that you can feel um when we walk places or travel somewhere and sometimes places we've been there like you know all the time like we've been there a lot Asheville North Carolina right I can just feel I'm back there I can mm. just feel it there's a certain smell, maybe according to seasons, you know. Um, there's just exactly what you're saying, certain flavors if you go to certain restaurants. But all that can change, right? Hmm. And so Nancy and I always say there's this feeling that you capture. And even if things progress on, which they do in life, the same restaurant is now goes from being a um, Jamaican restaurant to suddenly being an Asian fusion restaurant. It's not going to be the same flavors. But still walking the street, seeing maybe the same tree, you still have that memory. And I feel like you leave a piece of you wherever you go 
And that yeah. when you come back, it remembers you. Like your body physically, I know it sounds weird, but your body physically remembers places. And yeah. then there's places, so it can progress, it could change, the tree could get chopped down, but you still feel the tree there when you walk through there again, if you go back. Yeah. So I feel like there's this weird chemically scientific thing that happens and it feels woo woo and sounds woo woo, but it's this actual energy exchange that happens when you go somewhere. And I also think it happens in DNA that you feel like we have deja vu, right? You feel like you've been somewhere. Maybe it was your ancestor and you, mm. you know, and I've been to places where I just, there's something, a huge pull in me about a place. Yes. And maybe I'll do my family history one day and find something. And I have actually in life, which is very trippy when that happens. Yes. You know, and, and funnily enough, I have actually taken people to places and they say, do you know, I feel really comfortable here. Mm. And 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 that that is it is, you know, that they they sense it, whether it's in their DNA, whether it's in their imagination or whatever it is, but they actually feel relaxed and comfortable and they feel as if they fit in mm -hmm. where they are you know where their ancestors lived and it, it could just be that they you know they know that that's where their ancestors live so therefore they feel happy but it, it could also be who knows we you know we don't there is so much that we don't know but well you know i don't want i don't want to space people out oh but come on <laughs> it is all it's all about an experience and and if, if you if you can feel taste smell things you're experiencing something that your ancestors would have experienced and that makes you a bit closer understand them a bit more well you've talked about taking um a writer out on a tour of an area that she was writing about in a yes. book yes. and going on i think you were in the moat or something and no we was on the broad. And, on the broads okay the oh here we're back to the broads back the Norfolk broads. broads um not the women by the way we're going to be in Asheville just now and there is a French broad river and anyway yeah. she's French it's a French <laughs> river um but every time I see that name I think of you it sounds terrible but yeah, it it does like Nancy Glenn would like it here there's a French broad uh, but yeah. I don't mean it that way but um you, now I've got the giggles on it but you're talking about how for her to be in the place and in a setting that she can write about it better, right? Yes, so definitely. when we're talking about today, I know today our main theme is these living history museums that you went to, yeah. but it's really true when you go to villages that maybe they've recreated, maybe it's the same thing, or they've even used the same word, or maybe not, they've just reproduced something so you can feel and understand. That yeah. makes you go back in time to have an understanding, which I think we really need. To have that understanding of our ancestors and um, yeah. what was it like to be at war? Go stand in a battlefield, go see unmarked graves, and that will change your perception a little bit. Yes. Well, I mean, a lot of these things are just about about scale as well, because when you go into, you know, like a, a cottage, you know, a cottage that my ancestors lived in would only have been about that high. You know, mm -hmm. they they weren't they weren't like because uh, in England now, I think the minimum that a room can be is something like seven foot high. Mm -hmm. So the ceiling has to be that high. But, you know, in, in, in days gone by, like the house where my mum lives today, where I grew up, the the house, the ceiling is that high, you know. So when you go into these old cottages and you actually see and feel how big the rooms are, how low the ceilings are, how small the windows were, you know, then you can understand wow. what it was like to live in a place like that with, say, a dozen other people, because that's mm -hmm. how families would have lived, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you then you understand when it when you learn all about the window tax, for instance, you can understand why windows were smaller because they used to tax glass. You can mm -hmm. also understand why windows were smaller because a lot of windows didn't actually have glass in them anyway. They just had a shutter across them. So you don't want to have a great big hole in the wall to let in all the 
draft. Mm -hmm. So you have a tiny little hole with a shutter across it and curtains so as you keep the draft out. If you had a big window, obviously you'd be frozen. So, you know, but actually being there and experience it, I have to tie my arms down, won't I really? Um, to actually be there and experience it, you mm. then get an idea about what it was like. Mm. Nancy and I once went to a um, Gothic jail in DeRitter, Louisiana. And it was like being in a lighthouse with this, the center being circular with the stairwells yeah. going up. And I swear that place is haunted. Others say not. But um it was freaky and they hanged two guys there down yeah. the center. And so they have a rope hanging there to represent the hanging. Mm -hmm. And so if they didn't put the rope there, you'd go, it's still creepy. But just the fact that they put a rope there to remind you freaks you out a little bit. We're getting towards Halloween, Glenn. So I have to add that in oh, there. Oh, there you go. Yeah. But, but what really got me is downstairs is the, the jail warden's house. And they have a room, tiny bathroom, tiny kitchen that we went through. They have, a, you know, this is the husband and wife's bed and a little bed for the kids. Yeah. And I'm going, I never knew kids grew up in a jail. You, We can all complain about our childhood, but oh my God, imagine growing up in a jail <laughs> with inmates yeah. above you. Yeah. People being hanged in your home. <laughs> Yeah, And then they had women in one cell that, you know, they actually ended up putting in a cage because the women were hanging things out, you know what I mean, out the windows and people were throwing candy and all kinds of things up to them for showing their bits. So then they put them in a cage in the center of the room and so that they wouldn't have any traffic. So you want to say, talk about broads, <laughs> but could you imagine this and and it's dark, it's all closed off. I would never have understood that if I had not gone there. No, exactly. And and you can't you can't get that understanding. You can't appreciate what it was like for people unless you actually go there and feel it mm. for yourself. And and that that is that really is such a massive thing. It really is. It's it, it is. I don't know. I can't explain what it what extra it adds to your knowledge. It's texture. Your, it, it just tells you everything about it. It makes it real. And so you went to a, a few living history museums. So yes. where where is the is Ironbridge Gorge? Yeah, Ironbridge Gorge is the area. Um, Ironbridge is behind me. This is Ironbridge. Um, so there was a, a village there um and they actually did a lot of iron smelting in the 18th century and they obviously this was a fantastic advert for them this was the first cast iron bridge in the world um and they made they built that in 1779 and it's still there today. You walk over it. We walked over it. Beautiful bridge. Oh, wow. Um, you walked over it? Yikes. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I was telling you earlier, that is where I took the photo that's behind you mm -hmm. from. I took the photo that's behind you from the middle of that bridge where, wow. where that person is standing on the bridge is where I took the photo from. But, you know, they built that to span the river and also as an advert for what they can do with iron. Mm. But that then built up the whole area so this this was all where they made china where they made cast iron where they made clay tobacco pipes where the, they they were making everything in that area and we were able to visit several different factories so we went to a clay tobacco pipe factory which was amazing to see how clay tobacco pipes were made because I didn't know how they made them. Mm -hmm. But there we saw them. We saw them being made, which was amazing. Um, we went to a couple of museums, um, China museums, because this was a big area for China clay as well. Um, China, the, the pottery, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of China. Um, that oh, really looks like China. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's that's, a, that's one of my favourite people is young Homer. Um <laughs> 
But um, they they also made those beautiful Victorian china tiles for the for the wall. Oh wow! For the glazed tiles. And there was a fantastic museum there of all these beautiful Victorian tiles. But the 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 one that I've always wanted to go to since I saw it on the telly years ago was a place called Blist's Hill, which is just up the road from the gorge itself. And that is a, a, a Victorian town. So basically what they did is they renovated a lot of buildings that were already on site because it was a, already an industrial site in Victorian times. So they renovated a lot of the buildings. But then what they did was they brought in a lot of buildings that were being demolished. So if, if in a town they were going to put a new road through and they were going to demolish a row of Victorian cottages, they would take the cottages down brick by brick and then they would transport them over to the museum and put them up again. Oh, cool. As, as they were. Um, then there were Victorian shops. There's a Victorian pub. There's a police station. Wow. You know, they're all different things. But the interesting thing is that it is it is a Victorian street. So you're walking down wow. the street and you've got Victorian shops. You've got wow. people dressed in Victorian, you know, no. the, who work like there. Proper. Yeah, people are dressed properly, you know, the workers. And then you've got people in the different shops, factories, whatever they are, in their costumes doing what they should be doing and explaining what they're doing. So, it, it, I mean, for instance, we in the clay pipe museum, we had a man who actually was making clay pipes in the old fashioned way. So he was explaining that to us. Uh, in the grocery shop, we had a young man who was explaining all about groceries in Victorian times. Uh, in the print works, we had a young man who was printing cards in the great big cast iron print cool. and press, you know, and then in the candle, it was a candle shed. And basically it was a shed where this man was making candles. Uh, there was a blacksmith's. There was um, a, a woman who was uh, harnessing up a car horse, you know, and showing us how you would harness a horse. Oh, and wow. While she was doing it, you know, so for me, that was quite normal because my granddad still had horses on the farm when I was little. So I knew all about that. But for someone who's never seen a cart horse and with all his gear on, to see it being put on and having it all explained while she was doing it was fascinating. Mm. You know? And all of I'd them sorts it. of things were, were going on. You know, there was a Victorian fairground so there was the old, oh, wow. old roundabout, you know, the old gallopers mm -hmm. roundabout. There were the big swinging boats, you know, loads of stuff. And it was all just going on around you. And it was, it just gave you such you, a feat. You went in a time machine. Well, yeah, more or less. <laughs> That's a, But this is, you know, um, we've been to a lot of places like that here in this country and in South Africa. I remember uh -huh. in South Africa going to a Dutch farm. And, you know, they were churning butter and this was as a kid. Yeah. And it, it just I was like, oh, this is what I was being taught in school. But now I get it. You don't have to, yes. you yeah. know, and that's what got me into loving history was going to these museums. And like I said, battlefields and where I saw where Ishla Wando Rock with, you know, the Zulu Boer history. Um, it, it just. When you see things, it it just makes that impact on you. And I think grave sites really freaked me out as a kid because it made me really <laughs> yes. realize about war. And I was reading yeah. a lot of historical novels at the time. But in this country, we have those villages. But what's so um, mostly Western towns, like in um, we were talking about Jamestown, which yes. is around the corner from Jamestown in California. Jamestown, Cali uh, Jamestown is a gold mining town, and right. they've left the streets as it was, and so there was like an old hotel a uh, gold rush hotel so it's gold rush time from the 1800s down the road is columbia which is a state park it is the best preserved gold rush town in the country right. and everyone's dressed in gold rush period clothing you yeah. can stay in the hotel and they're dressed in that and i have a photo of a ghost from there a real one and i do i'll i'll send it to you 
the lady, Dude. the girl is dressed up, you know, in um, period dress, and behind her is a shadow of somebody. It's weird, okay? So anyway, if you can figure it out, let me know. But I don't know. It's weird. The place is haunted. You Horse and carriage going by. You can see the yeah. old print shop like you're talking about. Yeah. You yeah. go in, old candy store. You know, Tombstone, Arizona is like that Wild West kind of thing. So some of it gets a little bit gimmicky in some places, yes. but yeah. you still, but it's fun. Come on. Who doesn't want to yeah. go in? You know, it, 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 it's like when you say going to a pub over there, you're going into a Western saloon. Yes. It's of course. cool. But um, Victorian is really special, Glenn, because Victorian here, we have a lot of Victorian homes, right? And Victorian bed and breakfasts, and, you know, yes, but the street isn't Victorian anymore. What's left is the home. It's not the street, really. Right. So that is something I don't think I've been to a Victorian village as much before. I'm trying to remember. Right. Yeah, we see. That's I mean, special for, for us, we've still got lots of Victorian streets hanging around anyway, but they've been changed over the years. So although yeah. although you know the streets are still Victorian, you know they've probably got new glass fronted shops in them and things like that mm -hmm. but what you've actually got is not only the original shops the original shop fronts but you've got the proper stuff in the windows so you can see what they sold mm -hmm. you know and you can see the prices and you can go in the shop and you can have a look around and see what else is on the shelves mm -hmm. and you can talk to the shopkeeper and you know, they know their job, they know their business, so therefore they can answer your questions. Mm. And that, that is the most interesting thing, because although, yes, they, they're actors, they're, they're mm -hmm. modern people, but obviously they've got a love of history and they research their character so they can actually talk to you. It's about huge. And we have we're, we're, some of our national parks here do it. Um, yeah. So a lot of that happens here. But it's like we're we're hoping to have a resurgence of younger generations wanting to continue doing this. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, I think that's important because it's oh, I mean, to be, uh, in, yeah. in, in in this place there were a lot of young people. I mean oh, the bloke that's fantastic. Was, the bloke who was doing the print and works, so I should think he was probably about twenty five. Oh, that's know? cool. You know, and the, that's there was cool. the, one of the girls in the chemist shop and the dentists, I think she was probably 20 you know she was only a slip of a girl so to speak did you did you feel like you needed to change clothes and put your cell phone away <laughs> it isn't would, it well, weird I, to have that I, kind of technology was, at the same time i was taking lots of pictures <laughs> yeah i bet i bet but you, did you feel like uh oh i need to change my clothes i'm underdressed for victorian times or well you know i think i think the thing that that really got to me was remembering so many things or you know all right I was not around in 1900 but when I was growing up a lot of the stuff from 1900 was still about mm -hmm. you know and it was all it was all just coming back to me we went into the school room you know and that they had the same sort of desks that I sat in because my school was built in 1859 yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, there were loads of old desks in my school. You know, we still had desks when I was little. We still had desks with the inkwell at the top of the. Yeah, of the, me too. Know. Isn't that cool? We I exactly. don't know if they have them anymore. No, they you don't. You had to they slide have, in. They, you better be they, able to fit. You weren't allowed to have that extra mince patty because you had exactly. to slide in. You, you exactly. know those ones? Yeah, they're all connected, and you could lift the lid. Yeah. And put your books in. Yep. Exactly. So you're, you're, you're giving your age away. But, you know, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that it's them sort of things that you get when you go to a living museum is that you get that and it just memories, yeah. you know, memories. You, come in now you've got me all tripped out. I love going to old school houses, yeah. you know, especially the one one room schools. Like I always think about that, all the different ages in there, the poor teacher, yeah. you know. You could have a teenager in there with a five-year-old yep. in yep. one school. And then yep. you had the dunce cap. Do you have the dunce caps? Yeah. We didn't have that at school. They're in all the museum ones that we go to. I the know. One, and someone has a dunce cap. And I'm like, I don't remember having a dunce cap unless maybe no. I was wearing it the whole time. No, we know. never we never had them at school. But, <laughs> you know, there's the, the things that 
the big things for for me are all the stuff on the walls mm -hmm. you know the posters on the walls in the shops and also in the school i mean and the pictures of people even if you don't know them yeah i i like looking at what were they doing in the town what were they dressed like yeah who were they what were they doing when they were crossing the street where were they going you know did they have coffee that morning no speaking of that i could <laughs> use some more coffee today but i'm just <laughs> saying you know that it's like i always just want to know what they were doing i went to a village in um minnesota recently amazing they had the old gas pumps because so they had all these different eras in one village right they had the churches they had with the steeples yes they had like the music room they had the gardens what the gardens would look like back then mm -hmm. what were they growing yeah they had everything the school but the gas pumps from the gas station from like the this you know the 30s and 40s kind of thing yeah. so um, and it's not as old as what you're talking about with Victorian era, but Glenn, it's it's amazing. So yeah, you stayed at a bed and breakfast, right? Oh, you went to a different room. Look at that. He flipped. Yeah, it I've over. gone to a kitchen. I've gone to a kitchen now. No, that's a nice kitchen. It's lovely. And and you could smell the soot, I bet, when you were in there. And 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 sometimes they they actually do baking and things. So you not only do you mm. go to the place, but you smell the food. You know, oh, that's you, dangerous. you see people working, you know, mm -hmm. and, and again, that's all about getting the right feel of a place mm -hmm. and thinking yeah. how many people were working in the kitchen. I mean, the one the one thing I did check on um, and I wrote it in my article was that, you know, in 1860, well, this this actually is one of the big houses that we went to see that were owned by the, the big family who, who ran the ironworks. Um, and in 1861, the the man of the house lived in a a, a big house uh, in Stoke Poges, which is not too far from there, um, with his his wife and his mother, who was 80. And they had a the, the two ladies had a companion, you know, to keep them company. Um, so there were four adults in this big house. And they had 15 servants looking after four people. Oh, my, you know what he. Like exactly. What? 15 for what? servants to look after these four people. You know? for, for why? What, because they could, you know. But what were they doing? I mean. Oh, I want a cup of coffee. Well, no, they wouldn't have a cup of coffee. They'd have a cup of tea. But you know what I mean. Yeah, I want a Should cup I of tea. try that with Nancy? Yeah, not right now. That. Not right yeah, now. She's that. on deadline with the magazine. She'll come yell at me. <laughs> but you know, it, they they had they had servants to do everything. They had kitchen servants. They they had people to to do the gardening. They had people to brush but the stairs. Fifteen for four 15 people. For four people. And the two of them kids. No. No, there's four oh. adults, and they had fifteen servants. But, you know, yeah. that was normal for these big landed families. Well, I need someone to clean the car. <laughs> yeah, well, that, well, there you go. That's what, that's what you have. Isn't you know, that wild, though? I car. mean, but that's what they were, you know, that's what life was like. Well, yeah, it's changed up here a little bit, hasn't it? <laughs> Just, Just a, a little bit. But, I mean, that's why I personally, I always love going to kitchens when I go to museums, because that is where my lot would have been. They would have been below mm -hmm. stairs. At the kitchen table. There's no, nothing no. like a good kitchen table to me. I would have been scrubbing the floors, you know. Um, I know that for a fact because, mm -hmm. you know, all of my ancestors were were labouring classes. None of mm -hmm. them were rich. So they mm -hmm. would have been at the bottom end. They would have been the ones getting the coal wow. you know, and scrubbing the floors. They would not have been up there saying, I want a new cup of tea. You know, they would have been, yeah. in the, they would have been a servant. I have a question about the tobacco and the clay pipes. Oh, yes. So, so did England grow its own tobacco or were they getting it from the States over here? Because we're in they old get... tobacco land where we are right now. It was it was all your fault. Well, <laughs> I didn't do it. Nancy told me not to smoke and I didn't listen. Now well, I, I don't. But, you know, but yeah. um, back as a teenager, of course, I had to try it. Um, but, yeah, the tobacco fields, it's really interesting because. 
you know, where we are in, in North Carolina, you and Kentucky obviously has it, the tobacco fields, and there are still places with tobacco being grown because we still have a tobacco mm-hmm. industry, um, not as big. But, you know, one of the things I wanted to see it, you know what I mean? I wanted to see what tobacco farms were like, even though I'm not pro people smoking cigarettes. I don't yeah. think that's a healthy thing for you or anyone around you. Oh. Yeah, well done, Glenn Cough, when I say that, <laughs> you know, you but, but you go through and, it, and tobacco is a beautiful plant, by the way. It's gorgeous. It, I've you never know? seen it. Oh, it's beautiful. The leaves are just, you know, amazing. And but you drive through these old country towns where there was tobacco and when the tobacco started going away, it really crippled the economy. So yeah. changes come. And now in North Carolina, a lot of the places that were tobacco are now becoming vineyards. And yeah. they have right. all this. I just did an interview with Joe Clark, who's a travel writer. She's like, there's over a hundred vineyards and wineries in North Carolina. I'm like, really? How come we didn't know about it? We're late, you know? And a lot of them were done over the tobacco. So I was just wondering about that because you see the old barns that are falling down and which I, I love the old barns and I love them when they're really old and crumbling down. But then I go, we're losing history, you know, here in the Blue Ridge Mountains, I'd love to do a, a segment on this, on how it connects back to England. There's so much English history, and I know Irish as well, obviously, Scottish too, but old little tiny neighborhoods. And you've got the old grist mill. You can see the right. little tiny graveyards and little shacks where people lived in the middle of nowhere, just yeah. surviving off the land. Yeah. You know? It's quite, it's quite funny that um, the tobacco has gone to a vineyard because it's replacing one voice for another, isn't it? Well, why not? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, hello. Well, you know, and then, well, don't forget there was a lot of moonshiners out here. Yeah. As well. No so there was a lot of I mean, when you, shine when you, was coming from when the you same mentioned place. In the, when you mentioned in the Blue Ridge Mountains, I always think of Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> That's right. That's I love, it. I love that song. I love that song. Well, next time I'll play it and we'll drive down. You know what? Next time we drive through the Blue Ridge Mountains, I'll play that song and send you a video. How oh, about that, that? That would be good. I love that record. Fantastic uh, record. That is. But it is see the connections of how history happens. Like we're sitting where the tobacco came from, right? Where you where where the pipes were, yes. You know? and, and, the, and you know that that was a massive industry. Clay tobacco pipes was a massive industry because obviously in Victorian times cigarettes weren't invented. Everybody smoked tobacco in a pipe. You never had cigarettes. I, I never thought of clay pipes, so I've seen them. I've always thought they were like cherry wood or you know wood. No, no, but normal. I never... When I when I say normal people, you know, the labouring classes had clay pipes. They were always made oh. of clay. Hmm. And they, they were know. fantastic. Some of them were really, really beautiful because hmm. obviously with clay you can make lovely patterns. So there were lots and lots of beautifully decorated clay pipes. Hmm. And you know, you can date the clay pipe by the size of the bowl because when tobacco was first introduced. It was really expensive. So a clay tobacco pipe bowl was only that big. Mm. But obviously, by the end of the Victorian era, clay tobacco pipes were bowls were that big. So tobacco was cheaper. So they they could put more in, you know, so, but that's a fantastic. You know, I'm not I'm not a smoker. I've never well, like you, I, I tried it when I was about 13 and I didn't like it. So I, I didn't smoke. Um but, you know, smoking is a fantastic subject to research. And the smoking, the stuff connected with smoking is a fantastic subject. Clay tobacco pipes is an amazing. In fact, a for art. a lot of archaeologists who are digging on archaeological sites from the time that tobacco was discovered in Elizabethan times. So we're talking from the 16th century, really when it started to come over here. Um, So any sites from the 16th century, you know, onwards, the thing that they use to date the site are clay tobacco pipes. Because they they changed, they changed so much over the years and they were so fragile 
that any clay tobacco pipes you find were broken within a few months mm -hmm. of when they were made. So therefore, it's really they're really good dating evidence. They're some of the best huh. dating evidence you can get. Now, what about snuff? Remember snuff? The, yes. The stuff stuff up their nose, isn't it? Yeah, then that's they're... mainly yeah. Georgian. They a lot of Georgian gentlemen use snuff. Um, that went out of. I mean, my uncle used to have snuff, um, so that was still being used in the sixties. But it, it yeah, I, I remember like as a kid, some people doing it. I'm like, why yeah. are you sticking stuff up your nose? Yeah, like what? That's not fun, you know. I'm like, is it looking for diamonds? You know, what's it doing <laughs> up there? You know, they're like, now I'm going into Monty Python. You know, the life of Brian. Stop picking your nose. But like, I always there's a kid going, what are you doing? Sticking things up your nose. But then here, there's a lot of people doing doing tobacco instead right. of smoking. Yeah. And you could see people with this thing and then this brown juice coming out of their mouth and then they spit it out. Yeah, lovely. Thank this you. This is a lovely conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, it's it's fascinating mm. because yeah, smoking, it's, it's yeah. history. We have to think about that. And also what you have to think about is this is why a lot of Victorian men and women um, developed mouth cancers. Because they were chewing tobacco and leaving oh, and leaving it in their cheek, so oh. they would develop cancer of the mouth, and oh. that was that was quite a common thing. But you know, again, there's something. It's history. You know, you have I, to think of these things. I didn't know we were going to talk about smoking today. So no, there's something interesting about the smoking side of it, right? Yeah. So our indigenous people here in the country, Native Americans. I mean, they are they make really cool pipes. You know, peace well, pipes and smoking. Smoking is a big deal. Um, tobacco, all kinds of the tobacco has been. That's a whole conversation. When I think about all the cultures around the world, I yeah. mean, marijuana is part of it too. There's like that whole history as well of like, when did it go from tobacco to to marijuana, or has it always been two separate things? Now you no, got me on a rabbit hole. Really, you know. Well, this country, it's legal pretty much everywhere now. Is it legal in England? No. marijuana it's legal no. here in some i don't know what is legal like how legal each place or whatever i don't quite know but man am i getting press releases every day for pot stuff right it's like no, it's it's not it's not in england hmm. something so it, uh, you know that is that is not something i have ever tried i never tried drugs even though i was around in the 70s as a no, teenager I have never done hard drugs ever in my never, life because never even tried. We had marijuana. commercials as kids. South Africa did a good job of showing commercials of like if you did heroin, you're throwing up in the toilet and you're in a dirty, dirty toilet. And right. I'm like, I'm not throwing up. I don't want to be in a dirty toilet with my head in the dirty toilet, throwing up everywhere. I'm not doing that. So I never did it. And then, of course, there's needles and all that. And I'm like, I can't do a needle. You know, I'm not doing that. And then like smoking stuff that was crazy, like cigarettes. I stuck around with that a little bit too long in my teens, but eventually got rid of it. Um, but there was a thing and I, I wonder about the vices. And that would be an interesting history of people because you weren't told there was something wrong with it. Like I didn't do hard drugs or anything because I was told yeah. it's bad for it, you. Right. At first, yeah, there's a lure to it. But, it just but, weren't um, something that we did. But it when it comes to my... cigarettes, it was pretty open at that time. Nobody knew it was bad for you. Well, everybody was doing cigarettes. I mean, all you've got yeah. to do is look at television and film from the 60s. And, and then 70s. it became a sex symbol for women. Every Everybody was smoking. But you see, in, in the 19th century and in the Victorian times, it was clay pipes and most of them were from the laboring classes the mm -hmm. rich people the rich men and women um were smoking cigars and they they were the ones who would be smoking the briar pipes you know the sherlock holmes you know oh, yeah 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 sit there like that with the briar pipe that's the that's the middle class way of smoking but your clay tobacco pipes was for your laboring classes mm. and you know like i say Anything that that makes corn you pipes. look, sorry, 
corn pipes. What about those that the corn pipes? Like Popeye had a corn pipe, I think. And then here in the States, we never had them. the corn pipes. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the slave workers use corn pipes, like a maize pipe. Um, no. They'd cut the center and use that because, you know, they weren't no. allowed anything. We, we never we never had them because I don't think in Victorian times we grew sweet corn to any extent, if at all. Well, the state's corn is. A, yeah, yeah, obviously. Corn is... But, you know, any subject that makes you look at history is is really good because you know you can you can start to look at anything that you've got around you and start to look at the history of it and you can you can go to a place like a living museum and find out about your your interest whether it yeah. be whether it be smoking or whether it be candle <laughs> making you I know, just didn't know. Like, yeah I didn't know I was going to be interested in smoking today but but no. it, you know studying something different too that it, you may not think you're interested in smoking but like you're telling it tell, tells us of what a civilization was doing at that time it's part of exactly. pop culture right yes. so we interviewed carl rates he wrote he's a professor in kentucky and he wrote all these books about the history of bourbon in kentucky which is right. you know a huge deal so he's like you know how we're known for barbecue and you know all of that well right. yeah you know, i just thought the south was good at barbecuing you know no, pigs got introduced to Kentucky because of all the leftover, whatever that stuff is from maize and stuff, all the extra, talking about corn pipes, all that extra stuff would create like a sewage pond. Right. And so they realized if they brought in pigs, the pigs could hang out in the sewage and would eat it. Yeah. And so therefore we have barbecue. And it all started from the pigs and the distilleries in in, in Kentucky. So there yeah. you go. And that's how civilization happened and in, in, in Kentucky, not civilization, but um Yeah. It it just is this huge part of history. And we interviewed an archaeologist, a bourbon archaeologist, and he goes right. in and part of his history and some of the best finds are clay pots from the distilleries and i'm going yeah. they use clay back then he goes yeah because i always thought copper just kettles and no, clay depending on who what and yeah. where well it's cheaper yeah so if it's it was cheaper. like and a shiner a, a local moonshiner it's going to be clay yeah. versus yeah can, and you can make it yourself you know you can't necessarily make a copper pot yourself but you can make a clay pot quite easily <laughs> you know I so said, no and, and it's exactly what you've just said you know there's always a reason for something to be where it is. And then you can look at the development of what it is and why it is. So, mm -hmm. for instance, the reason that there was this massive ironworks in that area was because there was iron ore in the in the hills around it. There were rivers, as you can see mm -hmm. behind you, there's a river so you could transport and you've got loads of wood so you can fuel yeah. all of the all of the the smelting works so you know there's the reason that things are there is because things are there because the stuff is there to make use of it exactly. and then once you start building it up then you realize well actually if you've got this massive iron works there and you've got all of these people working there you need to keep them in clay pipes for instance so there's going to be a clay pipe factory developed because he knows that if he makes a load of clay pipes, he's going to sell them to the workers. And then what you're going to find, you're going to find there's a brewery developed because he knows he's going to sell his beer to all the workforce. And they're going to be thirsty because they're working in a foundry or in an iron work. So they're going to be really hot. So they're going to be really thirsty and they'll spend the money on beer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when you start looking at all of this stuff, you can see why and how all these things suddenly appeared. It's Surprising. fascinating. And like here in this country, we have a lot of ghost towns. Like, yeah. so if a mining thing happened, here comes everybody or an oil, com like a company town, whether it's yeah. a mine and a refinery, uh, you know, whatever it is, a company town, you can see, oh, we're going to bring this in. Here's the growth. And basically, no matter how you look at it, the people are owned by the company, period. Yeah. Exactly. And then the company goes, ah, done, and the whole thing becomes a ghost town. Yep. And and you, you hear about these towns where you go there and there's a few ruins, but it's like this was the biggest town in Nevada at this era. And you're looking at it going, 
I just went through Las Vegas. This was the biggest, like, you know, and you're telling me, you know, this was bigger than Vegas at the time, you know, with brothels and, you know, dance halls and even bowling, bowling alleys back in the day. I mean, all of these things, because it kept building and building and building and people get into that mode of if they're like, if they're mining, they forget that the mine can strike out and dry up. Exactly. And that's what happens. Everybody gets in this prosperity mode yeah. and doesn't realize that all things shall pass. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Which is a good thing for, you know, when we're going through the bad luck time. But when yeah. we're in the bad luck time, we know, okay, you know, just take a few more steps and, and we'll hit the good. Yeah. But in that prosperous, and it's that that extreme thing that we all go through as human beings when we're in, in you know, not the prosperity mode, you think it's never going to end. But if you're in the prosperous mode, yeah. Then the money is going everywhere. And then all of a sudden the mind says, I'm done, you know? So I love this, Glenn. This, I didn't know we were going to talk about smoking today. I had no idea, but um, if Nancy was on the show with us today, um, she would start telling, telling all the stories about how I got caught, but, you know, <laughs> but I yeah. mean, you were talking, you were talking about, you know, um, boom and bust. I mean, I remember that a few years ago, I, someone told me about Detroit, and yeah. I had a look at I had a look at Detroit on on mm-hmm. the internet, and it and it was a it was a ghost town, you know. It, it, yet it, yet it and it's revitalized be. now. Oh, well, thank revitalized. God for that. But I mean, there there were uh, there were hospitals, there were libraries, there there were schools, there were colleges, there were the whole areas were just completely in ruins. Mm-hmm. because the bottom had dropped out of the market mm-hmm. and that is what happens you know it can happen today and yeah. it does happen today you know well, so that they just the yeah, let's not start about what's going on in the world no, of econ- economics well no but it is interesting i mean we went to erie pennsylvania and um that was a like it was like gettysburg was a big deal in history for me because it you know the civil war and so many graves and the the monuments for how many people came to fight for good good and bad you know yeah um it's just it's it's emotional and but erie was one of those places that really got me it it was very similar to what you went through at the iron um iron bridge gorge this area was in you know we read about andrew carnegie and all of these people and you know done shows on it and the history of what's his name that went around and interviewed him and Ford um ha rich uh, Napoleon Hill done a lot about Napoleon Hill and all of this and and so now I'm in their territory and here's the industrial revolution right there and you can see all the buildings are brick and you can still see the black on the brick from where the smoke was and then we went to the person who started asbestos his house is this mansion yeah and and it was ornate and it was victorian and had people go and do all these carvings these intricate carvings and he didn't give a damn about it he didn't care about that and he only had it to show off i'm rich look at me yeah and it was so ornate and it was the opulence was just dripping and oozing but it was all for show and that was the biggest thing when we went around it it was it was but we were on Millionaire Street. They actually, in the bed and breakfast we were at, Spencer House, and we just interviewed them again. They're on Millionaire Street because that's they even named it. And back then, being a millionaire was a big deal. I think it'd be a big deal to be a millionaire, but now we've got a gazillion. We have more billionaires than millionaires probably at yeah. this point. Yeah. But, you know, they have a street dedicated to it. And when we went in, the museum did a great job showing what Erie did, and it was doing things like making waffle irons and all of that, very similar to what you're talking about. But they're like, because they had the railroad, they became the central place for making cast iron mm-hmm. for all of these cast iron things. Yeah. And and it would ship off. And so you think of like where we were as kids, you know, in, in you know, Southern California to have waffles. Well, it came from this place. And I never, you know, now we get shiny little waffle makers for 10 bucks at a big box store, but it all started there. 
and it yeah. blew my mind and I still can't get past it. You know? it is amazing. Once you actually start looking at stuff, it is amazing. And all and, the people that came to work there because it was industrial. Yeah. And and how quickly things change. That is that is the most amazing thing because Ironbridge Gorge now is quite a small town. Mm -hmm. And and actually in its heyday, it was big. You know, it was a massive area of employment because of all the people who were working in the foundries, the mm -hmm. ironworks, the clay pipe works, the tile works, the china works, you name it. And there was all of those jobs and all them people lived there. And now it's not that big at all. Is that, did it help build up Birmingham? You were saying that it was near Birmingham. Yeah. Did that help? Um, because Birmingham always seemed a little bit industrial to me as a kid. I don't. Yeah. Birmingham, Birmingham is a massive city that, came from nothing. Birmingham was just a tiny little place, just mm -hmm. a village, really. And then it got industrialized. So, you know, this could well have been, you know, that it it's not far from Birmingham. So therefore, things moved to Birmingham, you know, because hmm. we're, we're talking here, we're talking the actual development of Ironbridge. You're talking about the early 19th century. Birmingham became really well developed during the middle and the late 19th century. So you're then talking about the railway. See, so mm. the railway made a That's massive everything. difference because mm. previous to the railway, the river was the only way to transport goods. As soon as wow. you had the railway, you could transport goods anywhere you liked. As long as there rail was rail history. Yeah. Oof. Rail <laughs> history is huge. You know, how long that... have we got? I know, man. We were. <laughs> All right, that's another rabbit hole. We went on a rabbit hole getting oh, on a yeah. train. My gosh. Well, I'm going to tell everyone Glenn's article is up on blendradioandtv.com. You can see his photos as well. And all of that is linked in the show notes. It's always fun, Glenn. And keep up with Glenn at norfolk-doors.co.uk. And, of course, he's here every fourth Saturday. Keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. Thank you so much, Glenn. We'll find another rabbit hole to jump into. Maybe oh, there's we'll be plenty Alice of in Wonderland. There's plenty rabbit holes around. <laughs>